Good evening, everybody. I'm Tom Jessel, a co-director of the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute, sponsored by Columbia University. And on behalf of the university and the institute, I want to welcome you to this evening's Stavros Niarchos Foundation Brain Insight Lecture Series. This lecture series is made possible through the generosity of the Niarchos Foundation. And it enables us to bring you four public lectures a year that highlight important topics of relevance to mind, brain, and behavior. And we're fortunate to have several members of the foundation here this evening. And so if you could just wave your hands, those foundation members sitting on the front row, then we would like to appreciate you. And on a larger scale, it's thanks to the generosity of Mort Zuckerman and the Jerome L. Green Foundation that the Institute, the Zuckerman Institute, will move into its new home on 130th Street and Broadway Within a month now, the first faculty are going to be present in the building sometime in early December. And since it's been 14 years in the planning, this is the cusp of realization. Um, and one of our imperatives is to make the resources of the Institute available to the local community through this public lecture series as well as other endeavors. And in addition to this lecture series, the Niakas Foundation has established a teacher scholar program, which is intended to provide high school and middle school teachers with the skills to strengthen their science communication programs at their local schools. And we have members of those teacher scholars programs here. And if you want to just wave your hands, um, and the students, some of the students are here, I think, also. So if you wave your hands, we'll be able to appreciate who you are. Thank you. But my main role tonight is to introduce Gide Williams, who is the chief of staff and chief medical officer of the Department of Neurology at Columbia University and the director of acute stroke services at New York's Presbyterian Comprehensive Stroke Center. Gide, if you don't know already, is an international leading stroke expert. And in addition, he's an innovator in community health education. So his own personal research is focused on the disparities in the evaluation and treatment of stroke, and in particular on community-based behavioral intervention. Now all of that is just a fancy way of saying, Gide is the man. Um, <laughs> and what his lecture today will describe is a novel intervention that he has created called the Hip Hop Stroke that targets inner city children as active mediators in the chain of stroke recovery. And Gide's great insight here was that there are simple steps that can be taken to improve personal health but too often, many people lack the basic knowledge, skills, and motivation to take these steps. And so I'm, my job, my second job up here, is to persuade Gide either to pursue the hip hop himself or persuade the audience to participate in that great venture. And you could start with me, Gide, because I'm the worst hip hopist um, you could possibly <laughs> imagine. And, Nothing could be more provocative than the title of his talk, which is, Can Children Save the Lives of Their Parents in the Throes of Stroke? So, Gide, come and tell us what you're doing. Thank you. So, I'd like to begin by thanking the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. Thank you, Tom, for that generous introduction. And, um, you know, if I get really excited, I might even freestyle before the end of tonight. But... <laughs> I want to thank my staff, some of my staff members that are here that have really been responsible for a lot of this work. 
I get to stand here and take credit for a lot of this, but it really is down to the wonderful uh, and diligence of, uh, of incredible people that I work with uh, who really do all the heavy lifting. Um, so my title is, uh, is really a literal question uh, that we believe that we have answered, and I'll share some of our, our experience with you. Um, and um, just to mention that this work has been supported uh, by the NIH and also the National Stroke Association. I have no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. So the brain is really a magnificent organ. It is the command center of human life. It is why brain death is death even when the heart is still beating. The brain weighs approximately 1.2 to 1.5 kilos. It contains about 86 billion brain cells or neurons, 16 billion of which are involved in conscious awareness and our ability to reason. The remarkable cognitive power of the brain is what allows human beings to build pyramids, to land spacecrafts on moving comets, to create such wonderful pieces of art and literature. But the brain also has some very practical functions. It helps us touch, move, feel, see, and a whole host of other things that are essential for our ability to function as independent and productive human beings. Now, even though the brain is only, only weighs about 2% of the body, it consumes about 25% of the energy uh, that's needed to run the body. And if you look at that in the context of a 2,000 calorie diet meal, that's about 500 calories going to supply the brain and all the functions that it participates in to keep us active and productive members of society. So this energy comes in the form of nutrients, glucose, and oxygen. And it reaches the brain via a very rich network of blood that is supplied through two major arteries in the front and two major arteries in the back, the carotid arteries in the front and the vertebral arteries in the back. And a stroke occurs when there is a sudden disruption of the brain's blood supply, um, and this can happen in several ways. So the first way is, um, is a hemorrhagic stroke, and a hemorrhagic stroke can occur when there are two types. The first is when an, an abnormal outpouching of the brain's blood vessel called an aneurysm ruptures and bursts. And the second is when the brain, the blood vessel itself, it's under tremendous pressure as we see in people with high blood pressure. And that ruptures and bursts and can cause a devastating hemorrhage that can be very, very disabling and can kill very rapidly. The second type of stroke is, uh, is an ischemic stroke. And um, we call this a dry stroke. Now, the names wet and dry stroke were not coined by me. They were actually coined by kids in our program. And I think they're very apt descriptions of what's actually going on. And so a dry stroke or an ischemic stroke can occur when, occurs when the, the blood vessel itself is occluded uh, by a blood clot, which can come from a more uh, proximal site, such as the heart or even some of the blood vessels uh, further down. Or these blood clots can also include um, you know, lumens that are diseased by a process called atherosclerosis. Um, and so these two types of strokes uh, can cause devastating disease in the brain, can kill, can maim, and can severely disable an individual. The most common of these two types of strokes is the ischemic stroke, and that is, the, that is responsible for about 80% of all strokes. The good news about ischemic strokes is that we actually have very good treatment for these ischemic strokes. However, we have to treat these patients very rapidly. And the reason why we have to treat these patients very rapidly is because for every minute 
that the brain is under this ischemic burden, approximately two million brain cells die. So two million brain cells dying every minute that the brain is starved for its nutrients um, from an occlusion that's taken place in the, blood, in, the, in the blood vessel. And so the good news is that these treatments are actually quite effective. But they must be administered within a very fixed time window. It's about four and a half hours from the onset of the symptoms to the time we have to treat these individuals. And the treatment involves removing the blood clot that's occluding that blood vessel. And so we have special medications. One of them is called TPA, which stands for Tissue Plasminogen Activator. And this medication is a, is a clot-busting medication and dissolves the clot and restores blood flow to the area that's under threat. And it's very important, again, I cannot emphasize that if we don't treat these patients within the, the time window available to us, then we can no longer treat these patients with TPA. And, and unfortunately, these patients must endure the disability uh, from the stroke. And so time really, really is critical. In fact, if you look at the relationship between time and benefit, you can see that for every 90 minute delay, you can see a decline in the benefit from TPA. And by the time you get beyond four and a half hours, you actually see that ben uh, risk benefit flip and you do more harm than good. So for every 100 people that receive TPA, approximately 32 people will have almost no disability and, um, about, uh, and they'll literally be either normal or near normal and about three people might be harmed. And the risk of being harmed uh, goes, goes up the longer we delay and goes down the faster we treat these patients. So in other words, the faster you act when someone is having a stroke, the more of your loved one you get to save. But it's not as simple as just acting fast. There's an entire process that takes place between the onset of those symptoms, the decision process that goes into deciding what to do about those symptoms, the urgency, the perceived urgency of those symptoms, the decision to call 911 or self-treat, decide to lie down and hope that it gets better, try to make an appointment to see your physician the next day. Uh, there's a lot of, there, there are many processes that go into making that decision. And often, not calling 911 can be devastating. Uh, and, um, and we are unable to treat these patients within that very critical time window. And so after the decision is made to seek care the right way, which is calling 911 by getting to the hospital, and remember that the, the syndrome, the symptoms, whatever is happening to you must be recognized as an urgent situation, you arrive at the hospital. And when you arrive at the hospital, if you come by ambulance, the ambulance calls the emergency room ahead of time and notifies us physicians that there's a stroke patient on the way we can begin coordinating and preparing for that stroke patient so that we can treat that patient within as rapidly as possible. And the reason why that call is critically important is because we have to mobilize, imagine how busy emergency rooms are. We have to mobilize the team that's responsible for evaluating the patient immediately. That includes the neurologist and a, an emergency room physician for obtaining a CAT scan and there might already be another patient on the CAT scan, and if we get that advanced notification, we can have that patient removed from the CAT scan because this is a time-sensitive, life-saving treatment. Then we have to send the laboratory test on the patient, and so we have to be ready to send those bloods to the lab, lab to be analyzed and tested, and then when we get all that back, then we can treat the patients after determining the patient's eligibility and making sure that there are no dangers lurking that will make it more harmful for us to treat the patient. This entire process, most hospitals can't do within an hour. There is a target to do this, all this within an hour of arrival. Uh, we are fortunately in New York Presbyterian, we do this in about 30 to 40 minutes, 
because uh, we have a very well-oiled system. But that call we receive from the ambulance is critically important, which is why calling 911 is the only way to arrive at the hospital if you are having a stroke. It's the major determining step for successful treatment. Tragically, only about 4 to 7 percent of all patients nationwide receive this clot-busting medication. And I'm sure you can all imagine what the most common reason of, for exclusion is. The most common reason is delay. It's delay in getting to the emergency room on time. And so what some people have done is across, I started in Germany, where they began building these stroke mobiles, which basically takes the emergency room to, puts the emergency room in the ambulance, and so we, when we drive to pick up a patient, we can actually treat those patients in the ambulance right outside their door. Now, there are four of these ambulances nationwide. We built one at Newark Presbyterian, and we launched our stroke ambulance last month. And the way it works is that there is a CAT scan on the ambulance, and a CAT scan technician. There are instant lab test equipment on the ambulance, so we can do your blood tests instantaneously on the ambulance. And you also have people like me riding around, uh, getting ready to treat you at your doorstep. So I'm actually going to be riding in a, in a couple of weeks. So a lot of my colleagues have already ridden on this ambulance, and we've treated several patients already in the ambulance at the doorstep of our patients. And we're the first in the Northeast to have this ambulance, and we think it's going to cut time to treatment significantly down. Remember, time is brain. Remember, every minute of a stroke, two million brain cells die. So however we can cut that time is very critical. But, but, all this doesn't matter if you don't call 911. Doesn't matter. And even today, only 50%, in some cases 40%, of stroke patients actually arrive by ambulance. Most patients fail to call 911 for stroke symptoms. They might decide to walk to the hospital, get public transportation, private transportation to the hospital. And remember, just imagine what it's like to walk into an emergency room. The nurse has you sit down, you triage you, you have people waiting in front of you, the doctor's not mobilized, the system hasn't been mobilized. Imagine the delays, the minutes, the, million, the millions of neurons that die as you're sitting, waiting to be seen in the emergency room. But if you come by ambulance, you have a great chance of being treated rapidly and uh, having a good outcome. Now, this is Rembrandt's famous etching from 1632. And it depicts the raising of Lazarus as told in John's Gospel, chapter 11. If you, if you look closely um, now at the, at the picture, it shows Lazarus the moment he rises from the dead, his sister Mary and the amazement on her face, and Mary's sister Martha, uh, right next to Mary, uh, just amazed at Lazarus' resurrection from the dead. Now, Van Gogh, when he was a mental patient at St. Remy in about 1890, got a copy of this etching from his brother Theo. And even though Van Gogh was not a believer in God himself, he was inspired by this etching, and decided to paint it himself. And so while admitted for severe depression in 1890 at St. Remy, Van Gogh decided to paint this painting. But he did a few things differently. He, he decided to leave Christ Jesus out of the painting, because he wasn't a believer in God, he decided to change the face of Lazarus to his own. He moved the entire scene outdoors under the glowing sun. And one has to wonder, 
what Van Gogh was thinking in that mental institution as he painted this in his usual post-impressionist style. Now, given Van, Van Gogh's life, I can imagine that he himself longed to be raised from the living death that was his life. But that longing never became reality. And that same year, in 1890, at the age of 37, Van Gogh shot himself in the chest. This was his very last painting, two months before he shot himself. It's called The Sorrowing Old Man at Eternity's Gate. But this talk is not about Van Gogh, it's not about Rembrandt, it's not even about biblical characters. It's about what could happen to you or me at any moment in time. You know, stroke does not only cause death and disability, it can also crush the very windpipes of hope. I have had patients tell me that the worst death is the death of hope. I have had patients explain to me that keeping a man alive in a state where he desires death is the worst punishment of all. But it really doesn't have to be this way with stroke. We have treatments that can literally make the blind see, that can literally make the mute speak again, that can literally make the disabled walk again. This is not about miracles. This is about science. It's about what we can do today. This is a patient, a real life case, who presented unable to speak. His eyes were deviated all the way to the right, drooling out of his mouth because he couldn't control his, his secretions, completely paralyzed on the right side, and was rapidly losing consciousness. He came in within that critical time window. Unfortunately for him, the TPA didn't work because the blood clot was so large that the TPA, the clot buster, didn't work. But thanks to science, there are other things that we can do in patients who fail TPA. We take those patients from our emergency rooms to our angio suites. We insert a catheter through the groin. The catheter contains a stent retriever. It's a clot retriever at the tip of the catheter. We thread it through the groin up into the brain. We super selectively localize where that blood clot is, and we use the catheter to pull out that clot and restore blood flow. This is the clot that we pulled out from that patient. This patient literally walked home. That is why neurologists in borrowed the term the Lazarus effect to apply to cases that have such dramatic recovery from our interventions in the hospital. But, but, the patient still has to call 911 and get to the hospital on time. If you look at data from New York City between April and June, and this is just a snapshot, this is just a snapshot but it really mirrors what's happening across the country, only 7.8% of close to almost 2,600 stroke patients actually received this clot-busting medication. 
And if you look at the 7.8%, among the 7.8%, you ask yourself, what happened to the other patients? Well, the other patients either didn't arrive on time, or when they arrived, we didn't know when these symptoms began because no one was recording the time of onset, and we have a very strict four and a half hour window, and when we don't know the time of onset, we can't treat, because you remember that chart that shows as you get further out, that harm benefit flips, and you start doing more harm than good. And so, Half of the patients got there too late. Another half, we didn't know when it started. And then there are some patients that will naturally be ineligible uh, by the CAT scan findings, blood findings. And so you can, we should be treating about 50% of stroke patients with this medication. But we're treating, in New York, 7.8%. Now, what is even worse is that amongst the black community, and also, to a certain degree, the Hispanic community, that 7.8% falls down to about 2 to 3%. So 7.8% is not particularly good nationwide. It's abysmal. But even within that abysmal rate of treatment, blacks disproportionately suffer more, 2 to 3% at best. And so, we have to ask ourselves why. Why is this country not acting fast when our loved ones have symptoms of stroke? And the, the reasons are complex. There are many people that have spent their whole lives looking at this. But there are several constructs that play a role, and there are several predictive variables that play a role. I'm just going to highlight some of the important ones. Knowledge of symptoms and their urgency. The presence of a witness, often the stroke patient is unable to activate him or herself, and a witness is critical. Often a stroke patient is ambivalent about what to do, and a witness becomes critical. The perception of, of symptoms are important. Sometimes these symptoms are perceived as, oh, they're going to go away. My arm will start moving again tomorrow. And the perceived urgency, the perceived seriousness is important. Now there's the lay consultation period. I'm going to call my uncle Bob. He seems to know a lot about this. I'm going to call my pastor. He might help. Call your PCP. He can't get through the office. Maybe I'll try him in the morning. Um, not deciding to act quickly and call 911. And then there are the cost benefits that take place. I'm too embarrassed to go to the emergency room. They're going to waste my time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's obviously the cost implications. Um, under insurance, high deductibles, copay, you know, it might not even be serious. I don't want to deal with that. But every minute you spend deliberating, you're losing two million neurons and you're becoming progressively disabled. And so I decided to focus first on the disparities in treatment. Because as I said, blacks are less likely to receive these treatments. But the problem can be extrapolated, can be generalized to the rest of society. It's just the way we approach targeting it is what is different. Time to presentation is often delayed. U EMS utilization is often too low. That the attitudes and beliefs that I touched on, the knowledge, the mistrust, the costs, and there's also, quite frankly, treatment failures re re related to unconscious bias in the healthcare system. And so we began to think about strategies and ways we could intervene. And we decided that children might play a role within the chain of stroke recovery. You know, I, I mentioned that 911 is called very rarely by the patient himself or herself. It's often the witness that plays a role. And children might be the family member present during the onset of strokes. So we hypothesized that not only can student call 911, but they might also be able, by teaching them, they might also be able to teach their parents what to do in the advent of a stroke, recognizing it as an, as an urgent situation that requires an EMS activation. We felt that children were also uh, a good choice because schools provide a captive audience for the kids. And also within the African American community especially, we have a number of, of kids living with their grandparents 
who are at high risk for stroke. And we have a number of, of children nationwide uh, being raised by older parents who are high risk for stroke too. So we felt that children might actually play a, a significant role in the chain of stroke recovery. So we put together a team that included pediatric psychologists. Uh, we put together entertainment industry experts and professionals and artists. Uh, we put together communication and behavioral experts. Uh, we created a student advisory board of fifth graders to help inform our intervention. We used several behavioral theories that some of you in the audience will recognize, including the elaboration, the elaboration likelihood theory, the health behavior model, the theory of reason action. And we put together, we developed instruments, measures, and validated instruments for measuring intent to call 911, measuring child to parent knowledge, self-efficacy, attitudes, barriers. We also be tracked real world stroke events. Uh, and then we evaluated the entire intervention in a very large <coughs> randomized clinical trial that involved uh, close to 4,000 students and 1,000 parents across 22 New York City public schools. We targeted the schools with the highest need based on the economic needs index, and we recently concluded the trial, and I'll share some of the results uh, with you. We incorporated a lot of different learning and retention strategies, cultural cues, relevance, making sure the kids identified with the con content. You know, stroke is an emotionally sterile uh, topic to kids, so you have to make it very exciting. Um, we used a lot of interactive strategies, including effectual, effective visual associations, repetition, the use of mnemonic systems, and then the use of music and rhyme. We borrowed a cue from Schoolhouse Rock and created Hip Hop Stroke. And we, you know, a lot of people don't realize that music has more real estate in the brain than even language. And it's a powerful learning tool. And it can also augment memory and really help, um, help with, with learning. And think about people, kids learning their ABCs. Uh, think about the way music is used in our kindergarten and, and early elementary school level uh, to teach language and learning. And so we thought that music would be a great option for children. Um, and we felt that um, hip hop would be the right tool for the community we wanted to intervene on. This is, um, this is, um, now, we want everybody to pay attention because we're about the to program show within the auditorium cool and it's a multimedia video. heavy intervention and, the and, the um, video, and the kids can get a little questions. excited during and the intervention. And if you're able to answer the question correctly, you will win a trip to the front of the stage and get a cool prize. <laughs> All right? All right, so pay attention. Cool feet. Hey, Brandon. So, Chauncey, how do you go again? So, we're collecting data from four, close to 4,000 fourth graders and fifth graders and sixth graders is going to be a challenging Attacks. So we decided to uh, pilot the, uh, the use of an AI audience response system. Um, and, um, you know, each kid uh, got a hip hop hero card with a personal identification number that they used. Not only we could track their responses through the ARS system, but they also used that personal identification number to log into our website. Um, and we could track their participation in our website, what they were doing, as well as their data across the test sequence. We published our experience with the ARS system for those interested, and um, we actually had uh, a very positive experience when we piloted it. Um, there are strong benefits to using it, but there are also disadvantages uh, that are outlined uh, in the article. And I'll share some of the media that we use in the program with you. Uh, this first video that I'm going to show uh, really uh, emphasizes the urgency of stroke, and by the end of this video, you should know how to recognize a stroke. Um, and then I'll share some of the other media with you. So this first one is called Stroke Ain't No Joke. What's up, y'all, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Doug E. Fresh. E. Fresh. And I'm here with the hip hop doc. Let's go! Let's go! Stroke! Stroke! Uh. Come on. 
come on, come on. Let me tell you something. Uh, everywhere I look, they be doing the stroke. Uptown in Harlem, they be doing the stroke. Statue of Liberty, they be doing the stroke. Kids, come join me and let's do the stroke. Come on. Stroke, stroke. Put your hands up. Stroke, stroke. Stroke, stroke. But if you see someone do it, it ain't no joke. Come on. a brand new dance that's sweeter than nation. By the National Association. Uh -huh. It could be done. And only you can do it For those that can dance and clap your hands to it Imitate like you're paralyzed and weak One arm as you slur every word that you speak uh, Stand in a line and pretend to be blind Loss of vision is one of the number one signs uh, Walking funny, stagger unsteady A twisted face will show that you're ready To do that dance that we call a stroke Ice pick headed, it ain't no joke Now if he don't sound right, then he's doing, doing the show uh -huh. Sway when he walks, then he's doing, doing the show uh -huh. Slur when he's talk, then he's doing, doing the show Call 911, cause it ain't no joke Now ask hey. for the face, and hey. ask for the arm Ask hey. for the speech, and hey. tickets for the time Time to do what? Call 911 Time to do what? Call 911 uh. hey. Ask for the face, and hey. ask for the arm uh -huh. hey. Ask for the speech, and hey. tickets for the time Time to do what? Call 911 And that's the way that the stroke is done. Come on. Everywhere I look, they be doing, doing the stroke. All around uptown, they be doing, doing the stroke. Statue uh. of Liberty be doing, doing the stroke. Kids, come join me and let's do the stroke. Come on. Stroke, stroke. Put your hands say what? Stroke, stroke. Say what? Stroke, stroke. But when you see someone doing it, it ain't no joke. And as a matter of fact, to be exact, this is not fiction. This is all fact. Kids from the front and kids from the back. This is what we call the brain attack. Now when I say brain, you say attack. Brain, attack, brain, attack. When I say brain, you say attack. Brain, attack, brain, attack. Come If on. he don't sound right, he may be doing, doing the show. Uh, sways when he walks, he's doing, doing the show. Uh, slur when he talks, he's doing, doing the show. Call 911, cause it ain't doing no the show. Y'all fast, and three hours cannot pass. Cause if so, it just might be his last. <laughs> Few seconds, minutes, hours, hip hop, die. Blockbuster got the power. Ooh. Everywhere uh, I look, they be doing, doing the show. All around uptown, they be doing, doing the show. Come on. That you a liberty, be doing, doing the show. Kids, come join me and let's do the show. Come on. Stroke, stroke. Put your hands up. Stroke, stroke. Stroke. Let me see when you're seeing someone do it. It ain't no joke, y'all. Ask for the face. Ask for the arm. Ask for the speech. Ask for the time. Time to do what? Call 911. Time to do what? Call 911. As a matter of fact, to be exact. This is not fiction, this is all fact. When I say brain, you say attack. Brain, attack, brain, attack. Boom. What up, what up, kids? This is a hip hop duck reminding you that doing the stroke, it ain't no joke. When Mr. Gibson had a stroke, you saw the neighborhood kids call 911 and save his life. It allowed me to give him the clock buster just in time. Cause as Dougie says, doing the stroke, it ain't no joke. No joke, no joke, no joke. So, so we also decided to, uh, we, we have a video game that we developed that's part of the homework package that the kids do when they get home. It's called the clock buster video game. When they run out of clock buster medication, they have to answer questions for weed oats. So they get very frustrated, they just don't play the game. And the answers are all in the rap. So if you listen close to the rap, the answers are right there. Make your speech slur when you talk. Head hurt and looking drunk when you walk. So recognize when you're getting numb. Never hesitate, call 911. We've also, I'm going to show you just one last video that really shows. Um, the, the role of a child 
and the influence that a child can have on a parent in the context of prevention and healthy behaviors. This one's called Keep Your Brain Healthy. I'm gonna tell you a story right now. Yo, yo. Here we go. Once upon a time in a city called Harlem, there was a young kid who had a big problem. Every time he came from school, he would observe the things his father would do that wasn't so cool. And he forgot the rules, no doubt, about what good living is all about. Cause his son was young. Yo, he wouldn't listen to the real good advice he tried to give him about little things in life that he was missing. And every day he'd say it twice so he would listen. Listen. You gotta keep your brain healthy every day to stay ahead of the game. You gotta eat right to run and play. Now let me say you something. He would see him on the block drinking beers and joking. A whole lot of coughing, some cigarettes smoking. His diet consisted of burgers and fries. He gained mad weight from no exercise. And of no surprise, his blood pressure rise. He felt the numbness in his arm, blurry vision in his eyes. And realized if he don't get on track, his son's right. He'll have a brain attack. And Come on, if not that. He can't eat as freely Cause he's been diagnosed with diabetes Come on. You gotta keep your brain healthy every day uh. To stay ahead Say what? You gotta eat right to run and play To stay ahead Say it again game. You gotta keep your brain healthy every day To stay ahead uh. game. You gotta eat right to run and play you gotta listen to this one To stay ahead of the So game. this is what he did Listen to his kid, the moral of the story is you never too big. Face, arm, speech, and time is that sign to never ever cross the line. Now he stopped smoking and drinking and start thinking about the kind of food he was eating and it changed his life forever. And him and his son sometimes exercise together. Sometimes kids see what you can't see. Sometimes kids see what you can't see. Sometimes kids see what you can't see. And in this story, the kid was me. So, you know, in addition, I could show you videos all night, but I just want to get through the rest of the talk to tell you, show you some data, and answer the question whether kids can actually save the lives of a parent in the throes of a stroke. So, we use homework activity. The homework activity includes playing the video game at home through the portal, and also through some activities, some fun activities at the end of this comic book, which involves watching some of these videos at home with the parent. Now, we surveyed internet access amongst our cohort, and we found that internet access was actually quite high. Uh, a lot of these kids had access at home, but for those who didn't, we also provided a DVD to them. Um, and then we, um, looked at the effectiveness of the program, um, not only on knowledge, self-efficacy, and behavior, but we also tracked stroke rates and stroke events to see whether these kids were actually involved in stroke action itself. Uh, we published a series of papers on, on our work, um, and I believe we have at least seven or eight papers uh, so far on the work, and we have many more cooking in publication, cooking in different journals, but the long and short of the story is that we, the intervention is three hours, three one-hour interventions in the classroom. And we found that with that three-hour intervention, um, retention lasts as far out as 15 months. 15-month retention. And retention is not just for one or two stroke symptoms. It's for all the cardinal symptoms of stroke. And there are five cardinal symptoms of stroke. And it also involves being able to identify a stroke uh, when presented with a hypothetical scenario that's filled with, with uh, often we include distractors in our measurement instruments. And so we saw 15 month retention. And I'm not going to embarrass folks in the audience to name all the cardinal symptoms of stroke, but imagine a fourth grader being able to do that and retaining that information for 15 months. But what was even more exciting to us was parental data. Now, all we did was measure data for the parents at baseline, then we measured it after the intervention, and then we measured it delayed at the delay time period after that. And we found that a baseline, when you compare baseline to after and delayed after, we found very significant changes in parental stroke knowledge. We found very significant changes in parental stroke knowledge. We published this work 
uh, this paper in the journal Stroke that really showed that these children can actually effectively teach their parents the five cardinal symptoms of stroke, what to do in the event of stroke uh, in these black communities. And these are kids from these very high need public schools. We've, we've reproduced these findings in our very large trial that we just concluded, and uh, we'll be putting that paper together very shortly. And so we looked at the model and we just asked ourselves, how do we scale this? You know, we can't put facilitators in every school across the country. And so what we did is that we decided to digitize the intervention and create a self-administered intervention that's purely digital uh, and create the modules. And then we pilot tested the digitized intervention and we found that the digitized intervention, the results, was just as effective as the facilitator-driven intervention. We had similar results. So what we did is we said, okay, this is how we're gonna scale it. And so we partnered with the Department of Health uh, at the state level, and we're now disseminating the intervention to 47 hospitals across the state who are going to be mediating the delivery of the intervention to their local schools across New York State. We've already recruited about 19 hospitals across the state. We hope to recruit 23 before, uh, within the next several months, and by the end of the study, we should have at least 47 hospitals through which we're going to be delivering hip-hop stroke to their, low, to their catchment area schools over the next couple of, over the next few years. Um, we reported the findings from our digitized intervention just to show that it was an effective uh, uh, intervention and we're now scaling the intervention to Oakland, California uh, and we're also uh, culturally adapting the intervention for a Czech Republic rollout. Uh, uh, and I've, I actually was at the Czech Republic recently planning that rollout to the Czech Republic, and they're recruiting Czech rappers uh, to <laughs> culturally adapt what we've done to roll out in the Czech Republic. And so the, to, the final question, the final answer to the question, can children save the lives of their parents in stroke? I'm not going to answer this. I'm going to let the kid, kids answer this for themselves. I wake up to go and use the bathroom to pee and I find myself next to the bathtub. I feel that little electricity coming down and everything stopped. I was worried I didn't, I didn't know what to do. Then I remembered what um, the hip hop stroke told me and then I did it. How, if you see someone that has blurry vision and their arm gets weak and they have a really bad headache, call 911. Daniel, I think because of his knowledge, he knew what, you know, what the right step to, to do, you know, call 911. I probably would be more panicky, but they gave me strength from how they behave and how they spoke to um, the um, 911 operator. You know, it gives you a second chance in life because I probably would have lost him. You recognized the signs of stroke in your own grandmother? Yes. What, what did you see that made you say to your mom, I think she's having a stroke? Well, um, my grandma, she was holding her head and she was crying and she could hardly speak. <laughs> and all those were things that you had learned in hip hop public health? Yeah. And you told your mom, and at first she didn't believe you, but she called 911, didn't she? Yeah. And how did it make you feel that something you just learned actually helped you save your grandmother's life? It felt, like, exciting. And so we have several other kids. I could show you data, um, but we just don't have time. I'm going to wrap this up now. But before we end, I want all of you to... Um, to know the symptoms of stroke. And so we're all gonna repeat these letters. The first letter is B, and B stands for sudden imbalance. B stands for balance. The second letter is E. E stands for eyes, sudden loss of vision in one or both eyes. The, the third is F for face, facial droop, facial weakness. The fourth is arm, your arm gets weak. And the fifth is S for speech, and T is time. So I want everybody to tell me, what does B stand for? Balance. What does E stand for? Balance. What does F stand for? Peace. 
What does S stand for? What does T stand for? Time. Time to do what? Call 911. Thank you so much. At the Zuckerman Institute, we are initiating a wellness center, and Gide is one of the two doctors involved in creating this world for the local community. And so I think what you've seen this evening is a fantastic testament to practical intervention in this one disease. And so if you have questions for Gide, I'm sure that he would be happy to answer them. And if you have questions, use the microphone there. Um, you just have to walk up and use that microphone. Don't be shy. Hip and hop. <laughs> A, fr a friend of a friend of mine has had terrible effect from a stroke that he had. And I asked, did he get TPA? And the woman said, well, he was told he wasn't eligible for it. Is there an age at which you can no longer get it? So no, there's no age. In fact, I treat, we treated a 103-year-old recently with TPA. So there's no age cutoff. But eligibility is important, and there are certain things that rule patients out. For example, if a patient has taken a blood thinner like a Pradaxa or Xeralto or a Coumadin, uh, then those patients generally, unless their that blood tests come back uh, normal, um, if the blood is too thin, we don't want to be giving a clot buster. If a patient, uh, we do a CAT scan on the patient and we find an abnormality, like a vascular abnormality, for example, uh, we might not want to give a a, um, the, the TPA. Um, so there are certain uh, things that we look for. If the, we do a blood test and the platelets come back too low, we might not give TPA. So there is an eligibility criteria that every patient has to meet uh, before we can clear them to actually give the drug. That's why in the ambulance we actually have those blood tests that we do them instantly uh, before we give the drug. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful lecture. Um, you mentioned earlier on about the two types of strokes. Are there symptoms to distinguish between the two? And do both have the four and a half hour window? So the, the ischemic stroke, which is the one that's caused by a blockage in the blood vessel, that's the one with the four and a half hour window. That, uh, that's the 80% of strokes are of that ischemic variety. The other type of stroke, the hemorrhagic stroke, the symptoms are, can be identical. The symptoms between a hemorrhagic and an ischemic stroke can be identical, except for one particular type of hemorrhagic stroke, which is the aneurysm bursting. That can look a little differently. But for the most part, they're indistinguishable. And that's why we have to do the CAT scan, because the CAT scan will show us if it's a hemorrhagic stroke or if it's the ischemic stroke. And we don't want to be given a clot buster to a brain that's bleeding. Uh, and so. Um, those are generally the two types of strokes. So yes, the symptoms do overlap significantly across the two. Oh, hello, and thank you. Um, could you either speak a little bit more to the history, timeline, and development of the Hip Hop Stroke Program or its future? Sure, so uh, the development, um, it all really started when I was, uh, I was, uh, I was running the Stroke Center at, uh, at Harlem Hospital. And um, every time a patient came in, um, they were always too late. And um, you know, so I said, there's something going on here. We're going to track this data. We're going to look into it. And so we did a retrospective analysis over five years of, of TPA utility at Harlem Hospital. And we were only treating patients 1.9% of the time. And the reason was that they were always coming too late. And then this mapped across the nation. It's a problem that has national scale, international scale, actually, which is why we're getting a lot of interest from, from many other countries about this program. And so based on those clinical experiences, I decided that it was really important for us to develop an intervention that can increase 
the proportion of people arriving within the tweet treatment window and the number of people who actually call 911 and arrive early. And so that was really the goal of the intervention. Um, and um, we think that the intervention does that. And, um, and the second question was the developmental piece. Now this was a hard, hard program to develop for many reasons. Um, you know, one of the things that the challenges in healthcare is that we don't, we don't do very well partnering with people outside of academia. You know, academics tend to partner with academics. We partner across departments, but we very rarely par partner across sectors. And for me, I had to partner with the entertainment industry. I had to partner with, uh, you know, teachers. Um, I had to partner, truly partner with kids. And so we first set up our student advisory board, which is a, a group of fifth graders uh, that nominated for merit, meritorious accomplishments from their champion schools. So we had four, um, five nominated, um, no, sorry, four fifth graders nominated to our student advisory board from, from four schools. So we had a total of 16 students, fifth graders. These 16 students were part of our core team. And they partnered with us in the development of the intervention. But in addition to them, we also recruited rappers. Um, and, and I was fortunate enough to recruit Dougie Fresh, who has developed a lot of this work with us. We also recruited DMC from Run DMC, Chuck D from Public Enemy. More recently, we've branched out to work with Ariana Grande, Jordan Sparks, even Mattis Yahoo who works with us now, uh, Ashanti. So we've built our, 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 uh, our collection of artists that work directly with us in these projects. And so we, we bring them in, we bring our students in, we have our academics, our stroke experts, we have our communication experts, our behavioral experts, and we have this incredible transdisciplinary team that work together in developing these using models of behavior change in our developmental process. It was a very iterative process. It took a while uh, to develop, and, and thousands of children went through pilot, pilot testing before we arrived at our intervention. We had to work out the right dose, frequency. There are many things we had to work out. So it was an iterative process before we arrived at this. With regards to scaling, we realized that we initially had a model that used uh, lay health workers. We trained lay health workers. They worked as facilitators. We thought that if we trained lay health workers, that we could train teachers to deliver it. Um, but then we decided that we, you know, we decided to make it even easier. And so we wanted to know if we could have a fully digitized program that's self-administered by students, because we felt that would be easier to scale across the country. And so we found when we piloted the digitized version, and Ellen, actually one of my staff, we want to stand up, Ellen, and wave. And so Ellen was one of the ones who led the, 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 that particular pilot study. We found that uh, it was just as efficacious of our facilitator-driven model. And so we fully digitized the program, and now we have cr created a portal through which you, the kids' schools can log in, they get their school identification number, students get their own, their own personal identification number, you can do it in a computer lab in school. It, it's, a, it's, an, it's a 40 minute, 30 to 40 minute each module. They only have to do three modules. They can space it in time, um, and they complete this self-administered module. And we've shown that it's just as effective in terms of uh, the outcomes um, as our facilitator-driven model. So that's the model we're now scaling across this state to Oakland and also to some other countries outside. Um, okay, so I have two questions, right? Um, so they're unrelated. So the first one is like, how long did it take to make the experiment? Um, because you mentioned how you switched to digital, like reforming and stuff, right? So how long did that take to come to that idea? Because like, and you also went through a lot of piloting. And yeah, the second question is, how does TPA exactly work? Um, Great questions. So how long? You know, the idea didn't take long to come up with. It's the Trans is the taking the idea and making it reality that, that, that took time. Um, you know, ideas are not, they're not, I mean, I, there are a lot of ideas, but it's the, it's the materializing those ideas that took time. The process was tough because, you know, there was always tension in our group. You know, I'm, you know, I have Ellen, myself, our, our team is meeting, and, and, and we have lay health people, we have rappers on the team, and so everyone comes from different worlds and has different perspectives about how to do things. 
And, um, you know, some of our artists are, are really, uh, you know, they're, they're divas. You know, I'm just, <laughs> they, they need a lot, of, a lot of maintenance. And, um, and it takes, you know, literally I'm, I'm at the studio till 1 o'clock in the morning, um, you know, working with, with uh, uh, my team of rappers, you know, getting home late. Um, and, um, and, you know, it, it, I can't even tell you what I went through. You know, I, I went through a lot de developing this work. But it was very important to me because I believed in it. I believed that this was the right way to go and it would be, my hypothesis was that this was going to work. And I just had to prove it. And, um, and so, you know, I, I, I just say to all the students in the audience that if you have an idea and you believe in it, um, you have to work hard to materialize it, regardless of how radical that idea may seem. A lot of people in my department and in academia thought I was crazy. You know, I mean, it's hard to develop an academic career working with rappers, but, <laughs> but, but I, I think I managed to do it, um, and I, I've convinced a lot of people now that, that it's worth pursuing a strategy like this outside the box. Um, your second question? TPA. TPA, well, TPA is, a, just to simplify it for you, it basically dissolves the clot. Um, and restores perfusion uh, to the brain. Uh, th thank you. My name is Prem Pungalia. Uh, my question has more to do with science and technology going forward. Um, you said four and a half hours was the critical period, and timely recognition, detection, and action was the key. Uh, can you share any statistics? How is divided? How long out of the four hours do people take to recognize that it's real, it's happening, and how much time you're left with statistically? So on average, you need to get to the hospital within an hour, within, an, within three and a half hours. Because the time, I mean, if you go to a place like Columbia, we can treat you very quickly. But many hospitals need a minimum of one hour from arrival to treatment to go through the whole eligibility process and get the CAT scans. Now, That's okay. the, so you need to get there within three and a half hours. But sure. with the, the earlier you get there, the better. You know, the earlier you arrive, the better your outcome. So we want people to come in even within 30 minutes, and we would tr try to treat you as soon as possible. Regarding the decision process, and the processes, the cognitive processes go into making that decision. It varies, you know, but that's why these types of interventions are critical because patients quite literally don't know what to do. They're scared. They think they slept on their arm and it's going to get better. They try to take a nap. They self-medicate. Some of them even take an aspirin and they're having a hemorrhagic stroke. They get confused. Stroke itself. Stroke itself can cause syndromes called neglect that prevents you from even recognizing what's happening to your own body. It can incapacitate you so you can't even make, do the, make that action. And so, you know, we don't have an average time it takes, but we do know that the median time, uh, one epidemiological study found that the median time from symptom onset to arrival at the hospital was about five and a half hours. Uh, but breaking it up into components is we really don't have that that uh, granular data, but about five and a half hours. That leads uh, me to ask you the science technology question now. So, there are sy symptoms, and you're depending on cognitive abilities of the patient himself or herself, or the people surrounding the patient. Yes, exactly. And, right, and that's yes. the bottleneck. To, to recognize those symptoms, they have and to that be recognized. That's with the bottleneck, but there are signals biological signals or physiological signals present when event is occurring. Yes. And my um, question to you is, given the variable technology, we carry phone, we are online all the time. You're okay. asking about a biomarker that can be detected via Types a wearable of biomarkers, device. Variable technology, okay, which can detect and convince the patient that, hey, it's really happening, take action. Well, you know, honestly, that's the holy grail. You know, if we can identify um, a a type of biomarker that a technological device can pick up that's valid and reliable. Uh, the validity and the reliability has to be established. And 
I th I'm all for testing something like that. But, um, you know, perhaps in the future we can, we can find a biomarker for stroke, but we don't even have a blood test biomarker for stroke at, at this stage yet, let alone converting that to a, a wearable device that can pick it up validly and reliably. But I do think it's an interesting idea, and I think it's something that we should uh, encourage partnerships with our technology folks. Yeah, it's an electrical event. It's a neurological system. So it's fair to assume that EEG has an No, EEG has. EEG can pick up a lot of different. You know, if I EEG'd um, 1,000 people who didn't have a stroke, I would find, you know, focal slowing. Uh, and all, all you see when a patient is having a stroke with EEG, if they're not having active seizures, is focal attenuation in the area of the structural abnormality. So EEG itself won't tell us that it's a stroke. If a patient had head trauma in the past, the EEG would be abnormal. Uh, so it's something to think about, but I don't think we're there yet. Let's get the next question. <laughs> Good night. Um, you said there is only one of the ambulance, which is the the mobile stroke treatment unit, which is at Presbyterian Hospital. So I wanted to know, what is the success rate so far and approximately how much patient has been treated? It's a great question. So we literally started, um, I think we launched it three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and um, at Columbia, so it's a, MYP is both Columbia and Cornell. Okay. And I know that in the last three weeks we've had many calls but I believe we've only treated two patients so far in the ambulance um, at Columbia. I think Cornell has treated more because uh, they started before us. So the ambulance rotates between Columbia campus and Cornell's campus. Uh, but it's just started. We partnered with Fidney. And so when the call, when 911 is called and it goes to Fidney's uh, command center in Brooklyn, if it's in our Cashman area, they dispatch the stroke ambulance to go to the, to the patient's home. And we neurologists, we ride in that ambulance um, to the patient's home and we can treat the patient. So it's a very new thing. There are only four of those ambulances in the country. There are only five of them in the world. And so it's a very, very novel thing. We're actually looking at the cost effectiveness of this stroke mobile currently in a research study because we don't know if it's going to be cost effective or not. And so we're looking at that right now. Question related to what was just asked. I'm curious about um, the directions taken in healthcare outcomes overall, and if you plan to research um, the percentage changes in patients receiving TPA within a timely fashion. I mean, so we know unequivocally that um, patients who get TPA, you have a 33 to 50 percent odds of of zero to minimal disability when in among those who receive TPA w within three months. So the outcome was a functional outcome using functional in indexes, like we, we use the Bartel and another one called the Modified Rankin Scale. But we know that you have a 33 to 50% chance of zero to minimal disability if you receive TPA. Now, the Lazarus phenomenon is something that we started to see with our endovascular techniques. Uh, the, the, these are the patients that have these very large stroke syndromes that really would kill you, should kill you. And we go in and we, we, we just pull out the clot, and we restore blood flow, and they dramatically improve. That occurs in, in fewer patients with a sub subtype of stroke called large vessel disease. Um, and so we see the Lazarus phenomenon with those, that group of patients. But do you expect to see, instead of maybe a 7 or 8 percent of patients receiving TPA within a timely fashion, maybe with this program up to 20 or 30 yeah. or even more? So we, at, at Harlem Hospital, we increased uh, thrombolysis as a result of this program from about 1.9 percent to 8 uh, percent. Did that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Megan. I'm one of the teacher scholars for the high school cohort. Um, and I have a two-part question. So the first part is, why did you decide on the age, rate, on the age range that you did, the younger kids? And um, the second part is, would you consider running it with an older group in high school? Or um, what recommendations or what changes might you make for an older group? So that's a great question. So the first thing is that we know that, um, that habits, health habits tend to consolidate around age 12, and most, recommend, most uh, 
most of the data suggests if you want to intervene, you, you got to start before age 12. That's, that's just general cardiovascular disease prevention data. But so there were a few studies that came along before, before my study. The first was the Brain Child Project. And the Brain Child Project looked at patients, looked at uh, kids from kindergarten through fifth grade. Then there was the KIDS project, which is Kids Identifying and Defeating Stroke Project. And that looked at uh, kids sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And then we had our pilot data. But two things that we learned from the Brainchild Project. One was that those younger kids, we saw very poor data in terms of learning and retention from K through third grade. And we saw a sweet spot around fifth grades with the Brainchild Project. With the kids project, we saw that learning and retention was great, sixth through eighth grade, where we saw very low parental participation in that group. Perhaps because by the time, I don't know if anyone has an eighth grader or a seventh grader in the house, but they, they, they tend to be a little bit too cool for parents by that stage. <laughs> and they don't want to sit down and kind of, you know, you know, hang out with parents and do homework, and they're more independent. So when you, when you, when you look at the tweens, they, tweens tend to value connectedness. They tend to, to some degree, um, um, uh, 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 you know, are still under the influence and the sphere of parental, and it's still, there's still that connectedness, and they like to share things. And, and so we thought, you know, let's look, at, let's look at that age group, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And let's, we're not going to worry about the too cool, you know, high middle schoolers, and we're not going to worry about the, the kids too young. And another thing about the youngest kids is that one of the goals of this program was child-to-parent transfer of, of knowledge and behavior. And the younger kids in the prior studies just, just couldn't really do it effectively. Um, the older kids seemed to be too cool for it. And so we felt that if we focus on tweens, we might have a shot. And so we began pilot tests. We actually piloted at third grade when we first started, third, fourth, fifth, and we piloted all the way up to seventh grade, all the way up to eighth grade. Uh, Frederick Douglass Academy was one of our middle schoolers. But we found that child-to-parent communication was best within that tweens age group. And, and so because of that reason, because of the need to use the children as conduits, mm -hmm. we wanted the age group that we felt would best do that. And our data shows that that age group actually does it pretty well. That is not to say that you can't develop strategies for the older kids. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that you, have, you might have to use a different approach, maybe peer-based interventions for the older kids. Uh, but what we've targeted and the way we've designed our instruments was specifically for that age group. Thank you. At Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, there is a sign outside which says, amazing things are happening here. And I think tonight you've been treated to an amazing display of practical clinical insight. And so I want to just thank Gide for giving this information to us, to you. You're a lucky group of audience, and we'd like to thank you thank for you. this. And just to remind you that on February the 8th, 2017, we have the next of these Nyarkos Foundation lectures by Francis Champagne, and it's going to be, nothing could be as good as what you've heard tonight, but it's going to be really great. Thank you.